Good morning, teachers and students. Um, we are starting to let everyone into the webinar and uh, we'll be getting started in just a minute. So while we wait, we have this really nice view of Carpentry Estate Beach for you all to enjoy. And uh, we'll be starting in just a moment. All right, we are going to go ahead and get started with our program this morning. It is 8.15 and good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and uh, pull everyone up on screen, Jen, so that we can see all of our interpreters statewide. We have a really exciting program for you all. It's so exciting to see everybody all up and down the coastline. We're going to be visiting our friends from um, all different parts of the California coast as we cruise along today. But I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're going to kick it off with a little bit of learning, and then we're going to go and explore our coastline. So, Jen, if we can go ahead and put the uh, first slide up on the screen, that would be great. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Erica, and I am with California State Parks, and I'm really excited to welcome you to the California State Parks King Tides live stream. So, on this next slide, you are going to see a map of the entire California coast and you're going to get to see where we're gonna be cruising along today. So Jen, can you bring up that next slide? Perfect. So today we are going to be cruising from the south all the way up to the north. And as we float up the coast, we are going to be answering some really important questions. So students, you may want to have uh, maybe a pencil or a pen and paper so you can help answer these questions as we go along today. So number one, what are tides? And what make king tides so special? Number two, how do king tides let us time travel into the future? Number three, how is sea level rise changing the California coastline? Number four, how can we safely observe and enjoy the king tides? They're happening this weekend, so it's gonna be important to find out. And then number five, how can we contribute to science? Did you know that you don't have to be a scientist to contribute to science? All right, so let's go to the next slide. We gotta get started with just laying the bare foundation to what we're looking at. So what are tides? A tide, it's the term that we use to describe the alternating rise and fall of sea level in relation to the land. This movement occurs in the ocean and also in really large lakes, and it's driven by the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun on the earth. Throughout the month and the year, the positions of the sun and the moon change relative to where earth is. And of course, that has a direct effect on tidal heights, pulling them in different directions. When the water recedes at its lower level in the tide cycle, that's what we call our low tide, really great time to go tide pooling. And when it reaches its highest level, that's when we call it high tide. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on a special type of tide called a king tide. So what is it? Let's go to the next slide and find out. So king tides generally occur once or twice every year when the orbits and the alignment of the earth, the moon and the sun combine to produce the greatest tidal effects of the year the highest high tides and the lowest low tides. Tomorrow, Saturday, January 21st, is a new moon. So the moon will be in direct alignment between the earth and the sun. This weekend, our ocean will experience a strong combined gravitational pull in the same direction from both the moon and the sun. And the moon is also really close to the earth at this time of the year. So its gravitational pull is extra strong, helping create extreme king tides. So the king tides will appear along our shoreline as very high water levels. That's what we're going to be looking at today. Even though the new moon's tomorrow, we're going to get to see some of those effects today. We can also see the tides drop really low and the waters will recede into really extreme low tide levels. That's when it's a really good time to go tide pooling and check out the coastline. So beyond king tides being pretty cool as it is, you might be wondering why we're so excited to share king tides along the California coast with you. Well, the really cool thing about King Tides is that they give us a glimpse into the future. So let's go to the next slide. We're going to do a little bit of time travel today, but first we got to understand why King Tides matter and understand the impacts of climate change. Just one impact. That's what we're going to focus on today. And that's sea level rise. When humans burn fossil fuels for energy, we add a type of pollution called carbon dioxide to our atmosphere. 
This buildup of greenhouse gases acts like a blanket that traps heat around our planet and keeps it extra warm. Now, that's impacting our planet in different ways. Our ocean is one of those things that's being impacted. The ocean covers more than 70% of our planet's surface. And as climate change warms the Earth, the ocean is also warming. It's causing um, the ocean to gain more volume as heat warms the ocean. It expands in volume and the ocean itself is getting larger. But the ocean is also having more water contributed to it. As warming temperatures melt glaciers and sea ice, that fresh water runs off into the ocean and adds to that body of water. So as the ocean is impacted by climate change, it's becoming more voluminous. And that combined meltwater and a warming ocean is what makes sea level rise. So let's go to the next slide. So over time, sea level rise has been raising the height of our daily tides. As a result, high tides are reaching and extending further inland than they have in the past. Can you spot the bike path in this photo? So this photo was taken during a California king tide up in the San Francisco Bay area. So in the future, water levels reached now during a king tide event will eventually be the normal water levels that happen at a high tide on an average day. So like I said, essentially king tides are a preview of what sea level rise will look like along our coast in the future. I told you we were gonna time travel today. So many of you are joining us from across California. I know we saw a lot of California teachers sign up and register. And I know that many of us have all experienced the effects of the several large winter storms that hit the California coast and our entire state over the last few weeks. If you didn't see or experience these impacts directly for yourself, we'll have a chance to look at some of those today. Now, something that's important to think about when um, a couple of these storms arrived is that when they did arrive, they came on a high tide. So similar to these king tides, that high tide, and what that allowed was the storm surge was able to push the water further inland and it caused a little bit of coastal flooding. So we can expect to continue to experience these types of impacts as sea level rise continues to rise. <laughs> All right, so we've learned about tides. We've learned a little bit about sea level rise and discovered how king tides allow us to see into the future. You probably are ready to explore your coastline now because I know that I am. Our first stop on our coastal exploration is going to be at San Alejo State Beach. We're going to visit with interpreter Anita. So can we bring Anita up on screen, please? Hello, Erica. Hi, good morning. Look at that bright sunshine good and all morning. those waves. Yes, this is the southernmost part of San Alejo State Beach Campground. And this is also our lowest point in the campground. So if I step back, you can see that this high tide is battering the cliff wave after wave, causing erosion to this cliff area. We have lost three trees here just in the last few months. So if I take my little pin here and perhaps you can see, if you look, you can see the tree. There's a tree stump sticking out just on the cliff edge. Is everybody able to spot that? and it's leaning out. So the rangers had to clip that tree, the top of the tree down. So when it eventually collapses into the sea, they'll be able to take it away from the beach area. I'm going to flip my camera. And we're gonna walk over. This is our cliff area facing to the north. And our cliffs range from about 40 feet high to about 80 feet in the north part of the campground. So these cliffs are taking weathering and different types of weathering. So we have exfoliation from the heating and the cooling of the sand, sandstone on this cliff. We have high winds that cause sand pieces to leave the cliff and abrasion, cause abrasion on the cliff when it leaves. And then we have a constant wave action. So 
So if you notice, I'm going to pan out a little bit. There's our lifeguard tower, which we've lost use of. It's no longer operable because the wave, the height of the waves now are uh, not, a, not allowing the lifeguards to be able to climb up there and do their job. And then if you look right here at the edge of the cliff, when the wave leaves, you'll see a place where it's undercut. And that's a type of erosion happening. So when this cliff gets undercut, then the rest of the cliff above it will eventually collapse into the sea. And more recently, what's happened, if you take a look at the green pipe here, there we go. If you take a look at this green pipe, just in the last few weeks, this pipe has been exposed by a few feet. And we had some undercutting here. And we've had a lot of cliff failure since. So Jen, I brought a few slides for you to share where these folks can view it. Let's see. There we go. So you saw what high tide looks like here. This is San Lijo State Beach at a very low tide. Our low tide on this day was a negative 1.8. And this is a view looking to the north, just around that cliff face I showed you. Go ahead, next slide. And there's that undercutting where you see the red arrow pointing from 1A. All that constant wave action chews away at the cliff. And then what will eventually happen is that area above will collapse down and we're gonna lose that part of the cliff. Go ahead, next slide, Jen. All right, now you see 1B, you see that tiny little cave that's undercutting as well. And then after the last few high tides that we've had, we have already lost quite a lot of that cliff. So let's go see the next slide, Jen. Okay, you can see a tiny little bit of that green pipe sticking out. And we have lost that cliff face. We even have what we call block fall. And a lot of that sandstone has collapsed from the face. If we look at slide uh, number three area, now we've lost even more of that cliff face and we have weathering effects from the last rain where you see the ripples in the cliff. And now if you take a look at that green pole, you can see it's quite a bit more extended from the cliff. So lost quite a lot. So I have a little safety message for everybody out there. Jen, can we see the next slide please? Okay, so our picture to the left, you can see this is our friend Makar, and we are standing around five feet away from the cliff, and that's just not safe. You want to stand at least 15 to 30 feet from the cliff face on these cliffs here. And if you're at a place where the cliffs are taller, maybe over three or four school buses high, you're gonna to wanna to stay 30 feet or beyond away from the cliff. And that will keep you nice and safe while you play at the beach and recreate here at our campground or any campground with a cliff. Do you have any questions, Erica? That is so awesome to see those kind of before and after photos there. And especially since where you have your camera pointed right now, we are looking at those photos. Something else that I just noticed in your photo or in your live feed beyond the big waves that are rolling in is that there appears to be another building up on the hill. Is that is that another lifeguard tower that you have there? Yes, that is our lifeguard headquarters for our whole San Diego Coast uh, District region here. Wow. So there, so there is always somebody up there manning the tower. That's great. So even though the lifeguards can't access the smaller tower on the beach, they are nearby and helping keep folks safe there on the coastline. 
But yes. I also recognize that that new lifeguard tower is a little bit further back from the beach. And that's a term I know uh, called managed retreat. So it looks like state parks kind of preemptively built the new tower a little further back, anticipating that the change of the California coastline was going to come with sea level rise. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, Anita, thank you so much. The one other question that I had from um, our, our attendees, um, one student asked what types of animals or creatures live there on your shoreline? I know we're focused on tides today, but it's always important to think about the animals that live there. Oh, yes. Today we're going to have a magnificent low tide. It's going to be minus 1.7 or so. So that'll give the children and parents a, the ability to crawl out on the reef. There'll be lots of small and large tide pool areas where we'll have a lot of invertebrates like lobsters, octopus, sea anemones, and animals like that. So we just want to observe them here. This is a marine protected area. So observing is good, touching, not so good. We don't want to remove the animals from where they live. So we walk softly around here and we have fun spying on the animals at low tide. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about these king tides is getting down into the tide pools that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access on any given tide cycle. So that's my favorite part too. Um, I see lots of great questions coming into the Q&A. We're going to do our best to answer them as we go, but we do want to keep on cruising up the coastline. Our next stop is Karen at Carpinteria State Beach. She is up um, kind of near Santa Barbara, um, north of Los Angeles here in California. So Karen, hello and good morning. And I see you've got Christina there with you. Good to see I you I do, all. I have Christina. Hi everyone. All right, We're go both ahead and interpreters take it away. Here. Thank yeah, you. We're both interpreters here at Carpinteria State Beach. And I'm so glad you guys mentioned the lifeguard headquarters because I'm gonna go ahead and start there. I am also um, broadcasting from our lifeguard headquarters and we need a managed retreat for our um, headquarters. Uh, Christina's gonna go ahead and pan down here. And you can see from where I'm sitting, um, we don't have much space left um, between the storm surge and the king tides. Uh, in the future, we're gonna have to move our headquarters back um, in order to uh, keep up with the erosion from the king tides um, and the rising sea levels. Um, we can go ahead and go back. Um, about a hundred years ago, um, People who were mining for asphalt built this seawall here and they built it out of asphalt, the same thing that you'd build roads out of. And you can see that that seawall is no longer effective. Uh, that's one of the great things that king tides can show us during the extreme high tides um, is normally uh, the water never gets over um, this wall. And uh, today it definitely is breaching that wall. Um, now I wanna show you guys, um, one of my favorite things about king tides is that you get to see uh, something that you see every day. For me, it's the beach in a totally different way because of the extreme high tides, but also the extreme low tides. So last month, I did a time lapse, a 12 hour time lapse. And I started that time lapse at the top of the king tides when the tides were at their highest, five feet. And I kept the video running until they got to their lowest at 1.7, a negative 1.7. Um, and are we able to run that? All right. So here we go. As you can see, this is when the tides were at their highest. This was in the morning. And um, as it retreats, you can start to see our sand. Now, if you were walking along and you didn't know that the ocean was gonna come up that high, you could get trapped on our beach as well. So knowing where the tides are is good um, protocol for safety. And you can see that once the tides are all the way out, you can see our tide pools. Um, and that is more exposed than our tide pools are uh, on a usual basis. So um, that means that creatures that are normally underwater for that time, they are above the water. And again, um, when we talk about tide pools, we also wanna think about tide pool etiquette. And here we have lots of what are called um, aggregate sea anemones, aggregate sea anemones. And they're really small and they're squishy and they don't look like anything. Um, 
they don't look like sea anemones. We're used to seeing the giant green sea anemones and they're like this big. And instead it's like just a little bunch of, uh, little bunch of squishy things. And I see people walk over them all the time when they're exposed. Um, so that's one of the things we wanna keep in mind during the extreme low tides is how many creatures that are used to having that extra protection of the ocean are having to um, be exposed uh, to predators and our feet during that time. Um, so we have erosion here and during the storm, um, three out of four of our camp loops um, flooded. So we were closed for a few days after the storm um, to clear out all of the debris. Um, but one thing that didn't flood is our parking lot. And usually our parking lot was flooded every single year. And what we did here is we built an artificial sand dune. And that sand dune not only uh, has it prevented our um, parking lot from flooding, even during the storm, even during the king tides, but it has also provided habitat for animals um, like snowy plovers and our um, nesting seabirds. Um, it's provided habitat for them. So that's one of the um, things that we've learned from the sea level rise. Um, and that's one of the successes that we've had here at Carpentria State Beach. Any questions? Oh my goodness, Karen. The questions are flooding in. Um, All right, what so, so the first question was, has the ocean ever gone past that wall? And I mean, we literally just saw a wave crash right over that wall that's there in front of you. Um, so, what is what is the yeah. highest it's gone in your section of the coastline? Okay, so um, right now we have king tides and we had the storm surge. So there's no storm here. So yes, they have gotten higher and that was last week. And are you able to pan it all to the campground? Um, last week, the campground over here was completely flooded. So um, that means wow. that the water got all the way up past the seawall and then went in. But you can see the seawall gives us protection, whereas where the seawall ends, that's where all the flooding went in. Um, so it has gotten past that point, um, but it, it does offer a certain amount of protection. Yeah. And that's really important to think about as we um, as we look at, oh yeah, and there we go. We've got a great little diagram up on um, on the screen right now showing how that normal kind of the medium colored blue at the bottom is our normal sea level. You add sea level rise on top of that, but when you have a storm surge, it's going to push that water even further inland into our parking lots and our campgrounds, into our streets. Um, and that was something that did occur up in uh, quite a few of our, our parks that we're going to be seeing as we travel along the coast today. So um, thanks for sharing that diagram, Jen. And Karen, thank you so much. That was really great. And um, we appreciate that beautiful look at Carpentry Estate Beach. I'm glad that you are safely away from those waves because it looks like they are breaching over that wall right now. So good, oh, yeah. good choice being up on that lifeguard tower. <laughs> thanks for having us and visiting yeah. us today. Yeah, very good. All right. Thanks, Karen. Christina, we're going to cruise on up the coastline. Our next stop, we're going to go to the Channel Coast. So up into Santa Barbara County, um, we are going to be dropping in with Parker and Gabby, who are at Gaviota State Park. Oh, there they are. Hi, Parker and Gabby. Hey. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. It's good How are you to doing today? You. I'm so good. Happy King Tides. I'm so excited for this weekend. Um, go ahead and take it away. Let's see what's going on at Gaviota. All right. Well, we are super excited to have everyone here today. Welcome to Gaviota State Park. I'm Parker. I'm Gabby. And we are super excited to share with you a little bit about our king tides. And you can actually see some of the um, waves coming in right now as our tide continues to increase this morning. Um, and the uh, tide has actually come in a little bit more since we were uh, got here this morning. Um, it's about 10 to 15 feet. Um, behind where we're standing right here. And a majority of our beach is entirely covered um, by this increased tide that we have. Um, and um, I'll go ahead and we'll um, pan around here, give you a little tour. This is our pier that we have right over here. Um, but with the recent storm um, that we've had here in California, we've seen our increased high tides here up at Gaviota. And we've had a lot of debris that have washed ashore. Um, and it's actually these tides have actually made it into our campground um, and our day use lot. And you can even see here's one of our uh, trash cans here that normally belong just right up here on the other side in our parking lot. But because of that increased tides, the flooding that has occurred that has been brought all the way down to our beach. But we're kind of even here with our beach and our campground. 
as well as our day use. So when we have high tide events like this, well, that tide, that all that water is gonna make its way up this way here. So that's something to think about um, for planning and for um, our parks and our resources and protecting those resources too. So um, one of the things we found this morning that actually washed in was, was this. It's actually a piece of our pier. Our pier is actually closed due to a storm that happened a couple years ago, but we had another piece that had come ashore right now. Um, and Gabby, what else have we been seeing a lot of here yeah. along the coast? So we came here um, about a few days ago and we saw a lot of like sea snails and gumbo chitin. And with this high tide, they kind of washed back out to sea. But I'm seeing a lot of stuff. We usually see this on our beach, but we're seeing it like a lot right now. And it's these type of things. So um, our kelp is washing ashore from these storms. So they're getting ripped out of the ground and pulled up here. So this is the hold fast of kelp. Uh, you see it's a root-like structure. It's gonna be over the top of the rocks. And with those storms, it pulls it out, dumps it here on our beach. Um, and that's, you know, normal, but right now it happened, you know, in mass and came up here. And uh, one thing that we worry about is, you know, usually we have our rocky substrate out here in our ocean and that's what this whole fast holds on to but with our sand getting taken off our beaches we think that that uh, rocks out there in the ocean might have been covered by sand so that might worry us with how our kelp forests are going to bounce back uh, so that's something we're going to keep an eye on yeah and we can talk a little bit more about our sand and where yeah. it went because it's not here anymore we have yeah. a picture of what it once was like yes we do we'll bring up our picture here Awesome. So this is normally what our our beach looks like here. It's a nice, long, sandy beach. And it's normally not a lot of rock on it. Um, but right now we're seeing a lot of rock because those increased tides, those king tides are taking a lot of that sand out, like Gabby mentioned, um, off of our coast here. And you can switch to the next picture here. Um, this is what it looked like the other day at low tide. It's about a minus tide this day, about a zero tide, I believe it was. And you can really just see um, all of the rock. Normally this beach isn't super rocky. Um, and we have seen a lot of different things wash ashore. Like in our next picture here, we've had a lot of these. These are all gumboot chitons. And so when we do see some of these um, tide events and these storm events that we do see, um, lots of things washing ashore, especially like these gumbu chitons. So and we're also seeing some things be uncovered. If we go back a picture, we'll see that there's some pier pilings um, that's up in the top right corner. You can see them kind of sticking out on the beach there. And that was from about like eight, late 1800s of when we used to have that old pier there. Yeah, yeah so, so we're that's getting pretty some, cool. Some evidence of some past structures here that were buried in sand come back up and we're seeing them now. So that's pretty cool to see. Um, with our king tides. Yeah, and then if we fast forward here, yeah, right here, you can see there's Gabby and myself and Saima. And um, I want you to pay attention to where it says, note that rock. That's where we normally deliver our port programs from Gaviota State Park. If you've joined us before, that's typically where we hang out. But if we go to our next picture, you can see what it's like today. So there's that rock and there's Gabby sitting on the rock there. She's kind of hidden in the shade a little bit but we had about a five to six feet of sand loss off of to our side here. Um, so that's how much sand has really um, disappeared that has uncovered a lot about our beach too. Like Gabby mentioned about those old pier pilings that we are seeing that are typically out in this direction that we don't normally get to see, but with those events, we um, have the opportunity to be able to view the past as well. And we wanna keep in mind, you know, that sand was taken off our beaches. Where did it end up and when is it gonna come back? So that's some things we're thinking about. Yeah, so it'll eventually come back here, um, but it does take time to do that. Very cool. That's awesome to get a chance to kind of look into the past and see those those pier pilings, Parker and Gabby. We had that happen at a beach up in Santa Cruz too, where it, a um, old seawall from the early 1920s was re revealed. So it had been covered in sand. And then a hundred years later, the storm moves the sand away and we're able to see where the old seawall is. And guess what? It was closer to the waves. The seawall was deeper into the water. So it really shows how our sea levels are rising. Well, Parker and Grabby, thank you so much. We are going to have to move on. 
Um, it's great visiting with you. And we are going to cruise up the coastline next. We are headed to the Monterey Bay area. We are going to drop in with Alec at Point Lobo State Natural Reserve, uh, just south of Monterey, California. Hi, Alec. Good morning. Good morning, Erica. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Point Lobos State Natural Reserve. Uh, my name is Alec, and I am an interpreter here. And I'm standing here at Weston Beach, which is on the south side of Point Lobos on our southern shore. And this is what we're looking at right now. Uh, high tide was a few minutes ago at six negative uh, 6.5, or excuse me, positive 6.5 feet. And as you can see, it's pretty high, but uh, the waves are pretty mellow today, so it would have been a lot higher, and it did get a lot higher just uh, a week and two weeks ago. So I did take a picture at low tide. It's from the other side of, uh, of Weston Beach. So, Jen, if you don't mind bringing up that first photo, please. Um, I had to switch views because the sun was in my eyes right now. But we can see here... Um, there's a lot of exposed rock. Uh, that's all the tide pools that are here at Point Lobos. Uh, thanks so much, Jen. We can bring that down. So Point Lobos did endure uh, the brunt of the storms like a lot of other places in California, especially this southern shore. We got 16 inches of rain in about five weeks, and we normally get about 20 inches of rain in the span of a year. So we got 80% of our annual rainfall in about 10% of the year. Uh, which is an incredible amount. And besides the rain, we also got a lot of winds, uh, which downed a lot of trees within Point Lobos, as well as big waves that wreaked havoc. Um, and these waves went much farther past the edge of the screen here. So uh, they uh, went past our road, which is a good 50 yards uh, to my left here. And we can actually see some of the debris in picture number two, if you don't mind bringing that up please. Um, so the ocean brought uh, a, a ton of a ton of stuff onto the road. So uh, we have driftwood, we have kelp, we have all sorts of rocks. Um, and it really did wreak havoc here at Point Lobos. I did talk to our environmental scientists at Point Lobos and in the Monterey district about how we're going to fix this going forward. And they're still in the assessment stage. Jed, we can bring that photo down. Thank you. And I actually want to show you about one thing they have already done. I'm going to flip my camera around. It might be difficult to see, but you can see some piles of rocks right over there. And uh, well, actually, it's a little bit to my right here. So yeah, right there and right there. And these are already things that they've done for our managed retreat to try to protect our coastline here at Point Lobos. So we have talked about moving the trails further out into the meadow um, and doing other actions to prevent uh, further storm damage in the future, but that's a couple of things that they've already done. But we do have a friend uh, in, our, in a natural barrier and Parker and Gabby mentioned it. They have it uh, down at Gaviota. We have what's called a kelp forest here at Point Lobos. And uh, you can see the kelp forest is a magnificent ecosystem. It's really magical. Over a thousand different creatures rely on it, and so do us humans. So we rely on it for the oxygen we breathe, and also it provides a buffer, a barrier to prevent storms from getting too intense. So the kelp forest hasn't been doing too well in the past few years. So scientists are looking into ways to strengthen our kelp forest, not only for the animals that live out there, but also for us too, so that we can weather these intense storms moving forward. So Point Lobos is an excellent place to tide pool. Uh, later on today, it's going to be awesome tide pooling when the tides are super low. Um, I do recommend you check out how to tide pool because there are ways to accidentally harm some of the animals who live here. And actually, if you go to the Point Lobos Instagram page in our little link tree, um, you can find some tide pool etiquette to keep you safe and to keep the animals safe out there. Um, the last thing I want to share with you guys, something cool about Point Lobos and Weston Beach specifically, is that this is a site where the Marine Mammal Center uh, drops off some animals who have been rehabilitated from illness and uh, from injury. And animals like sea lions, California sea lions that we have here, or elephant seals, or harbor seals. And this is a great place to, to watch that happen. I've never seen visitors so stoked 
as when they get to see these marine mammals dive back into the ocean, reclaim their wildness, and uh, you know, explore the deep blue. It's it's pretty magical thing to experience. Um, so uh, with that, I want to say please respect uh, our trail closures that we do have here. The longer folks are hanging out on these trails that are closed, the longer it is until we're, we'll be able to use these trails or if they ever open up again. Uh, so we thank you for your cooperation. We're looking out for your safety and we're looking out for the health of our California state parks. Do we have any questions, Erica? That's, that is just a really great reminder um, about safe tide cooling practices, but also really respecting the closures. So many of our state parks and state beaches really experienced the effects of these winter storms over the past few weeks. And there are quite a few park closures or if a park is partially open, maybe the trails are closed please pay attention to those signs. They are for your safety. And it is really important that we have the chance to rehabilitate these trails so that you can get out on them and enjoy them again. So thanks for that reminder, Alec. Um, we do have lots of different questions coming in. Folks do really want to know about the tide pools. And I know you shared information about that, but we are going to cruise up a little bit further along the coastline now. Um, thanks to Alec at Point Lobos. Uh, we are going to jump up into Northern California for our last stop on this coastal tour. We are going to drop into Mendocino County with my friend Steve there, who is at Van Dam State Park. Hello and good morning, Steve. Happy King Tide. Good morning. Good to see you. And you know what? We are out here at Van Dam State Park today. Um, typically, you see me out in the Redwood Forest, um, standing next to the big tall trees. But um, today, I'm out here at Van Dam State Beach, which is you know, a really nice protected cove where we get to go out kayaking or lots of people actually go scuba diving or diving for recreation out here. Um, but, you know, over the past uh, couple of weeks, we've definitely received our fair share of uh, damage from the storm, the storm surges, as we kind of saw on that chart earlier today and seeing it all across um, our state today is like when you get those high tides, those extreme high tides, and a storm surge on top of that, you get lots of uh, damage happening. And if you take a look over here, you kind of start to see this kind of looks like a sidewalk or uh, well, this is actually a seawall. And this is um, in many different places throughout the state. You might uh, have places that uh, need a way to manage um, the ocean and try and keep it away. And um, when those uh, storm surges come along, you actually might see this, all this sand is starting to come in. And what is this over here? These are redwood logs. As driftwood flows out, I'm getting a little sun glare, sorry about that, coming through the trees. But you know, you wouldn't, if you weren't, weren't familiar with this place, you would uh, kind of think this was just the beach. I'm standing in the parking lot, as you see these lines here. And if you look even further over here, our parking lot is currently closed. All these uh, cones here keeping um, visitors from coming in here because, well, we have a lot of mess to clean up here. And if you look up even farther over here, <laughs> this is North Highway 1, um, which is our major access to the town of Little River. And you know, being in an area that's so close to the ocean, we have to um, have lots of ways to manage um, or defend our coastline. And this being a major thoroughfare away for um, the residents of this community to get in and out of this uh, town really becomes a problem um, if the ocean is uh, coming over the highway. Let's pull up the photos of from uh, last week, um, the Van Dam State Park. And you can see North Highway 1 on that photo, and you can see the double yellow line. So we, with the big storm surges, we had uh, swells coming in um, with the uh, cyclone bomb swell um, came over the, um, over that, seawall and then ran all the way up to the double yellow line on North Highway 1. Now, obviously, that's a problem because, well, our roads might have oils and different pollutants. It's also um, causes a major inconvenience for our uh, residents as um, creates a pretty dangerous situation. And, um, you know, other uh, parks in our area also had a lot of a lot to deal with with these uh, big swells. In fact, our um, Prized uh, light station down in Point Cabrillo. Let's go to the next slide. Was dealing with uh, waves that were, you know, a 33 foot swell actually drew a 50 foot wave over the top of that bluff and in through their back door. 
So you see that up in the left hand corner, you see that big bluff, a wave came up over through that and busted in their back door. Let's go to the next slide. So <laughs> we see there, um, they're all their museum um, uh, exhibits were um, damaged. Much of their retail, their uh, what they like to sell in their gift shop was uh, also damaged. And well, right now the Point Cabrillo Lighthouse uh, is um, actually closed to the public and it's gonna take a lot of work. So let's continue to the next slide. There's uh, more from the damage there. <laughs> So we all, all have to have uh, ways to kind of manage this. And while our, uh, while our um, ocean and our um, different ecosystems can do a great job dampering um, the effects of the ocean, we have to also think about ways to manage our retreat. And let's pull those down, uh, pull down the photos there. <laughs> so one way that we do that, of course, could be things like these seawalls and barriers that can protect us from uh, different flooding events. Um, but you know what really is important is trying to um, really preserve our uh, natural ecosystems because our earth has its own ways of defending the ocean or defending us from the ocean. Things like wetlands, um, kelp forests, even like mangrove forests, though we don't really have those around here. Um, those are all really important ways for us to um, manage the ocean and help dampen the, uh, the impacts of those uh, storm surges. So yeah, <laughs> any questions about that? Well, you did answer one of the questions in the chat. Um, someone asked, what is the biggest wave that has ever happened there? And so I, I did say, you mentioned that there was a 55 foot wave approximately that hit that uh, that lighthouse, which is just amazing to see that the water went up all the way over that cliff, across the top of the cliff, and busted in the back door of the lighthouse. Truly spectacular. And again, that's because we have sea level rise, and then a storm surge on top of that, on top of a high tide, all of those different things combined. So we're seeing these big high water events. Thank you, Steve, for so many tangible examples of what this looks like on the Northern California coast. It's really good seeing you at Van Dam, and hopefully they get that parking lot cleaned up soon so that people can return to the, the beach and enjoy it again. Those redwood logs do not belong there. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Steve. We'll see you soon. Um, next up, I want to welcome Michelle from the California State Parks Coastal Programs team. Michelle, are you still with us? There she is. Hello. I hear you've got some information for us on what California State Parks is doing in response to sea level rise. Yes, good morning and thank you, Erica. And I wanted to say thank you everyone for tuning in as we traveled up the coast together and learned about King Tides. Like Erica said, my name is Michelle and I am actually a scientist that works for California State Parks. Unlike the others that you heard from today, I actually live and work in Sacramento, which is pretty far away from the coast. But even still, I am pretty fortunate to have the job of helping our California state parks across the entire California coastline begin to plan and prepare for sea level rise. So today, like Erica said, I'm going to talk to you about why it's important to plan for sea level rise and what California state parks and coastal communities are doing to prepare for sea level rise. So first, I'm going to talk about why it's important to plan for sea level rise. You see, while it may not be obvious when looking at the ocean during an in-person or virtual visit to the beach, sea level rise is happening faster than you think and faster than scientists had previously predicted. As you've been able to see this morning as we traveled up the coast, rising water can cause some pretty serious damage to our coastline such as the flooding that we've seen and the erosion. A lot of people in California live near the coast or pretty close by and will directly experience the effects of sea level rise on their homes, on their roads and public services that are needed for their daily lives and for their safety. But it's also important to know that it's not only people living near the coast that are gonna be affected by sea level rise, but people all throughout California. As sea levels continue to rise, the rising ocean water will begin to affect different things. For example, it'll affect our drinking water. It'll become more difficult to grow crops and rising sea levels will affect how we move goods across the state because of impacts to our transportation, 
just like how Steve talked about Highway 1 behind Van Dam State Park. You may also be wondering, how does California State Parks fit into all of this? Well, California State Parks actually has 128 park units along the coast. And when you add them all together, California State Parks makes up nearly one quarter of the entire California coastline. These are all places where people from all over like to go and play and enjoy the beach. But these places will also be affected, like we saw today, by sea level rise unless we take steps to plan and prepare for that rising seawater. So next, let's talk about what California state parks and coastal communities are doing to plan and prepare for sea level rise. Sea level rise is a complex issue and it'll probably take decades to solve it, but by using the best available science and by working together, we can begin to start improving the future for California's coast. So for example, one important first step is to plan for sea level rise. What does planning for sea level rise look like though? Well, it means identifying and prioritizing areas that are the most vulnerable. We've seen some of those today. It also means working with scientists to know how fast the seawater is rising and knowing what actions can be taken to respond to rising seawater. Both California state parks and several of our coastal communities have adopted these types of plans as an important first step. Another important step is to prepare for sea level rise by taking action on the coast. There are several types of actions that can be taken to help us prepare for rising seas, and we've seen a couple examples today. So one example is by, by restoring our sand dunes and taking care of the native plants that grow there. Sand dunes act like a natural buffer against rising water, protecting our coast from flooding and erosion. That was just like what Karen talked about for their parking lot at Carpinteria State Beach. Another type of action is to raise structures above where the sea level is predicted to be, or to change the structure materials and what they're made out of so that they're more resistant to seawater. I'm sure you could think of some really great actions to protect our coastline too. And I think with that, I just wanna thank you all again. I really appreciate you tuning in and remember how we all rise to the challenge of sea level rise today will determine the future of California. That's so great, Michelle, thank you so much. And it is really important to stay focused on planning ahead and thinking ahead and not just patching and fixing seawalls and holes right now, but thinking about what are we gonna do for our coast so that in 20 years now, from 50 years from now, that we'll be able to enjoy it and recreate in our state parks and state beaches. So thanks so much for sharing that information. It's really good to have you here. And um, we always love when we've got a professional to come in and tell us all of the things. <laughs> all right, Jen, if you could um, get ready to put up a couple slides for me. Before we go though, I just wanted to say, we just had such an amazing look at the coastline today. And we got a chance to explore, like I said, from south all the way up to the northern parts of our shoreline. Um, I hope that you all are really excited to get out and observe the king tides along your local coastline. We had some questions of like, do the king tides affect the entire California coast? The thing about king tides is they literally happen everywhere on planet earth. But here in California, we've got this community science program called the California King Tides Project. You can access it at this website. And if you or your family can get down to a beach this weekend during the King Tides, we invite you to participate in this project. And what you can do is help catch or capture photos. You take photos. If um, Jed, if you wanna go to the next slide for me, please. You can take photos like these ones here, just snapping pictures of the high tide events along your shorelines. And then you can upload them to the California King Tides project website. And what that does is it allows us to help track how our shorelines are changing over time. And also so we can anticipate, this is what the shorelines might look like in sea level rise or with sea level rise in um, the coming years. So it's a really great way that you can go out and enjoy the shoreline and marvel at these really high water events, but also contribute to science as well. So of course, it's important to stay safe while you're out there and going on the beach. Um, Jen, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, really, even if the water or the weather is calm this weekend, it's really important to be thinking about things like never turning your back on the ocean. Um, if you do uh, visit when it's at low tide, being careful as you move around in the tide pools and being really gentle with the animals that you see there. And then of course, if you're walking along those cliff faces, 
we learned back in San Diego, right? We need to keep lots of space between us and the cliffs because of that coastal erosion and we don't want to have any falling rocks come down. So really, uh, really we want you to get out and enjoy these times. You can check um, the tides. There's a lot of different tide apps that you can use. Um, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has a great tide app that tells you the precise, your precise location and what the tides are gonna be. So you can check before you go. And then uh, next slide, Jen, really quick, please. Thank you. So last thing, though, we did want to let all the teachers know and parents know that there's a ton of free educator resources available both on the King Tides website as well as the Ports Program website. These are free resources that we really hope will support um, your students' learning and your children's learning as you go out and experience the King Tides this weekend. On behalf of everyone, let's go ahead and put all of our presenters that are still here with us. Let's get everyone back up on screen. So. Um, team interpreters, if you all are still here, let's give a wave goodbye. Thank you all so much for joining us for King Tides. Make sure to go out and enjoy your coastline and be safe as you do it. And we will see you for our next sportscast. There's Jen. Thanks, guys. Have a great one. Thanks for joining.